then i went into do my mca that's where i stepped into bangalore so i went to bangalore to do my mca that was kind of a turning point in my life the reason is that because uh, do, having done my bsc computer science i have seen whatever topics that i need to learn in mca curriculum is already something which i was aware of so when i joined the mca back in bangalore in a college called lands of college the first semester especially i got demotivated because there's nothing that i can learn new and uh, what happened there is that i went out of my curriculum i started looking for something which is challenging so at that point in time there was a very good uh, requirement for anybody who can instruct people so what happened is that i started joining up with uh, small companies that i can be an instructor as a guest lecturer so that's how i started my career the entire first year of my mca i was uh, studying in my college as well as i was doing a guest lecturer job as well uh, of course free of cost <laughs> then in second year i was a bit uh, uh, intrigued by the mainframe issue at that point in time in the year around 2000 uh, so because of that i started looking to mainframe i learned mainframe and uh, immediately after learning mainframe i started working as a freelance uh, contractor for ibm and uh, that's my first real career so while i was doing my mca i was also working in ibm as a freelance contractor and uh, immediately after that i joined uh, wipro uh, in 2004 and when i joined i joined as a senior developer in mainframe and uh, immediately after that i was uh, deputed to us so there was working for a uh, insurance company called patnam and uh, it went around for 3 years in 2007 i came down to uk and uh, i joined as a main team and a java developer and i started my career as a module lead and progressed slowly and in 2012 i changed my career being a developer into an architect so since 2012 till this point i have been working as a architect and uh, 2007 when i came to uk i joined one of the client and uh, since 2007 i am still with the same client and it's a banking uh, client i am not supposed to tell the client's name so apologies for that uh, but they are one of the leading banks within europe in fact they are the number one uh, by looking at the number of uh, customers they have they are the biggest bank in europe uh, so i am working as an architect and my sincere apologies that i can't share my video uh, i don't have a video in my desktop i'm sorry about that so but i'll be sharing my screen to go to the slides so that's all about me uh, that's about me uh, any questions or anything if not then i will share my screen and i'll present to the slides that i have prepared for you guys okay can you guys see my screen yes sir we could see your screen sir it's very clear yes. thank you thank you thank you friends uh, in your screen you can have an option at the top view option if you click that zoom ratio if you keep it as 50 percentage you could see the screen in bigger size please try it all right so let's get into microservices so before we get into microservices let's take a step back in history what happened so as you guys all know that uh, the term tuning machine uh, that's the first thing that you all would have heard about the tuning the term tuning machine came into existence by somewhere by 1920s and 1940s uh, basically they are mechanical machines which can follow some instructions that's what tuning machines are and uh, as 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 we progress as the technology progressed uh, during world war 1 and world war 2 uh, the main main problem in world war 2 was that uh, most of the allied nations uh, especially uh, britain uh, america and other people who were fighting the nazis they wanted uh, some way to crack the code that the nazis were using uh, that was the main main agenda at the point in time and uh, it was very cumbersome process to to crack a code 
so what happened uh, the tuning machine that which they developed they 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 made it much more sophisticated which helped them to craft the the code that they were using that's 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 the first advantage or the first stepping stone where a simple tuning machine a mechanical machine became a bit intelligent processing the data that that's been given to it and give us an information that's why it all started off with as the world war 2 started or uh, ended up uh, we all started looking into how we can use this this new processing capacity that we had got into place in 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 enriching our human life and at that point in time everything was used only for military based uh, things as the war settled down people within the industry started looking into how, how i can i can exercise or how can i get some advantage out of this machines and that's where things started popping out as many programming languages that came into existence so before that you didn't have anything called programming languages turing machine or mechanical instructions are given in a very hard way at what the inputs are then sophistication came into place so you are able to have some kind of a programs or instruction uh, you would have studied 8086 architecture where even to tell that you want to add two particular numbers first of all you have to load a number into a register have its register name then second number into second register then you have to give an instruction for adding and that add implicitly goes to those two registers and picks up the data and it, it sums it up and loads it to another register which you have to pick it up and move it into another memory variable to use it so a simple simple way of adding two numbers had a very big number of steps that you need to form in 8086 programming now as we started progressing more more sophistication came into picture where all those instructions the machine instructions that you used in your 8086 were able to given in a in a human readable english like language you simply say sum simply say add and you say two variables so the, the computer programs or or the the facility or how computers can understand what you wanted to do sophisticatedly increased and thereby you are able to got programming languages which are some compilers which where you write your program instructions to computers in a english like language it picks it up the compiler then converts it into a machine language which is basically your assembly code and then the assembly code gets executed by the computer so that's where we are in the era of 1940s to 1970s where we got different languages like fortran basic which were very widely used but still mostly are used for scientific purposes to to solve problems fortran basically is meant for scientific calculation you were using to to solve polynomials equations etc etc using the fortran programming language then came basic which was a common purpose uh, generic language which can be used for any other purpose like business for example then came into existence cobol so cobol was specifically designed for business processing where at that point in time files so data store is stored on files you give the file as a input you write a big cobol program which will open the file it will process you have also have one more file which will be the transaction file you pick the transaction then you do the accounting calculations or the business logic and then you write a output file which would be the master file for tomorrow's processing so that came file processing then we moved along from cobol to c uh, when c came into existence oh c is very more efficient than cobol because the the number of code that you have to to write to solve a problem they used because c gave you that facility and uh, with c start people start using not just for business programming they also can do system programming so one single common purpose language which can be used for system programming as well as application programming before that uh, c came into existence any business programming you had to do cobol you want to do some mathematical uh, solving a mathematical problem then you have to use fortran you still want to use some kind of system programming you still need to go to assembly level so assembly level programming is what was used to create device drivers in your windows uh 3.1 or windows uh 2000 windows 95 i think uh etc so there was there was specific programming language for specific domains as c came into existence it changed the world in a way that it's a one single common language which can be used for multiple domains so we we got more sophisticated then came c++ with object oriented uh, programming 
where people started looking into, oh, object-oriented programming, how can I use it? So till that point in C, we were trying to give emphasis on just solving a problem. You never took a step back to see, oh, how should I think about reusing this functionality? Functionality reusing was already there as a part of functions, but that functions was, was delimited within the parameters that you can pass with it. So you didn't have anywhere to expand it further. But object-oriented programming gave you that facility where you can devise objects, and that object can be used as a, as a, as a you can define it as a generic, depending on the context. You get, for example, you have different object-oriented uh, uh, properties like inheritance, polymorphism, uh, you got uh, constructors and destructors. So you, you got more facility, which means that just solving, a, instead of solving a problem, I invested a hell lot of time in solving a problem, coming up with an algorithm. I have implemented a programming language. Then tomorrow, the same logic can be reused for different use case. So when, when the use cases, a lot of other use cases, people started using the computers for different, solving different other problems, they saw that there were use cases which had a synergy between the various use cases or the components logic that they're using had a synergy between various use cases. So people started looking from an object computer programming says, oh, okay, all right. Since I've invested so much amount of time, why can't I define a library? That library will have certain methods, certain, certain functions, which I can reuse for different use cases. For example, ordering. The ordering still needs to go and get customer data. You have a customer classes or customer system, which will deal only with customers. So that still needs to go and read and write data to the backend, which is your database. So we moved from file process based processing to database at the point in time when object oriented programming came into existence. So all file process got, got old, it became legacy. Then we went into database, so back in this database. So each of the system that we have was speaking with the databases. Now we have a basic operation database, which is crude. You create, you read, you update, and you delete. That's crude operation that you do in database, which is common. Irrespective of whether that's a customer application or it is a inventory application or it's an ordering application, if you need customer data, you still need to go do a crude on that particular data database. So people started looking into it. All right, let's take a step back. Let's design modules, modules which can be reused. So there came module, concept of module. And that, that module had one-to-one -one relation with the objects and that's where the object oriented uh, design paradigm came into existence and uh, that ran between 70s to 2000 and after 2000 at the point of 2000 we got java uh, between 1990 to java, uh, 2000 we got java and along with c++ java was there the advantage of java is that c++ you still need a compiler and it is specific to a particular machine where you're running on it for example, if you have a C compiler and you are trying to run your application on a Mac system, you need a different set of C compilers. And uh, the, the C compiler, or uh, whatever the machine code it's building, it's targeted for that particular machine. You have Windows machine at the point in time. So C compiler for Windows was different. And the target code that it's creating is specifically for Windows. You can't use that target code for C on a Windows to run that application on your Mac. There was no interoperability between machines. That was a limitation that we had. As Java came into existence, this all changed because the way Java works is that it, it creates a virtual environment, whichever machine you're running it on, only that bit of the code needs to be specific to the machine that it's running. But the application you're writing in Java will run within the JVM and it uses whatever the JVM provides to you. Uh, so thereby, you're making a demarcation and you're making a distinction between your application layer and the underlying infrastructure layer. So that's what Java brought in, which, which gave us an opportunity to extend our horizon across various other applications or other systems, underlying systems. That's the reason why you have a Java code that can run on a mainframe, a Java code that can run on a Unix, a Java code that can run on a Windows. They all can talk to each other and uh, and perform a particular uh, activity that you wanted to do. So that's the reason why World Wide Web was, was flourishing at the point in time. 
because there are different kinds of servers across the world which are running on different various operating system. Java gave them a, a, a way to host the application irrespective of whichever the underlying servers are. So that's the reason why World War II just exponentially got popular. And because World War II came into existence, people were trying to use something called uh, components. So from modules, we stepped into components. All right, what is a component? So module is specific to a programming language. It sits within that concept. But what is a module is different. As you have an interoperability between heterogeneous systems now, you need to have components. So a component is basically the same as the module, but it has some extra distinction, which, which gives a boundary to what you mean by a component. So a component can be something like a business, which has a business logic. It doesn't need to worry about where it's going to run, what is the underlying hardware it's going to run, but it has a business logic. It has a way to, to interface with it. For example, what I mean by that is that it has endpoints. So we started creating APIs in Java and expose it via HTTP server, which was widely used in the World Wide Web, which is your internet. So that, that, that was our, our next advancement. Then after 2004, uh, there are Java itself exponentially uh, had other uh, architectures which were built and tools which were built within it. So Java was basically before you used to have Java code, which will be an applet. The applet will be the front end bit of it, which works on your browser. That applet will call something on the back end, which will have the business logic of what needs to be done. And to support that uh, business logic, you will have another back end, which is your database where the data is stored. So Java was having Java applets, then Java servlets, then you have your data layer. So we came into uh, some form which which we call as tiers to to create your application to solve your problems to 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 solve your problems you came up with multiple uh, layers by segregating things these are components so your applet which is the UI is a component your uh, business logic where your servlet which has a business logic JSP basically is a is a component then you got your data layer which is again a component so we started looking things into component now in 2004 as we moved across there were some new concepts called service oriented architecture came into an existence. What does it mean? We have module, we had uh, components, now we are stepping into services. What is that? So basically what it means is that, as I said that in the, in the previous uh, scenario where you got an applet, which has a UI, and then it calls a backend service, uh, which basically will expose an endpoint and it will contact the database. So, there are many, many, many services or many, many components that was created, which had synergy again, and uh, they were doing the same repetitive work. Uh, so the number of components within the uh, organization starts increasing, having the same logic being repeated everywhere. So you, you are ending up with a very big list of components, which you are trying to manage them uh, operationally. You have a cost attached to it and you need new servers to, to, to get uh, those extra bit of components to be hosted and run. So the cost increases for an organization. So the organization was looking into some way of, of reducing this cost. The operational cost of an IT department was so high that they, it, it even superseded the, the payment or the, or the salary that they're giving to their employees. So the IT operation cost increased a lot for an organization. So there was a requirement that how to reduce this cost. Then people came up with a brilliant idea of saying, all right, let's move on to something called service. What is a service? You have a, a business logic. Business logic is, 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 is common across various business CIOs. And we will create a service which can be used by those services instead of replicating the logic everywhere. So that's, that's where you start getting services. Services. Uh, you, the interface point for the service is an endpoint. It has a business logic, and the business logic will go and uh, crawl through any of the databases wherever it needs to go to. So the service oriented architecture gave an architectural pattern to create services. So that's what you can see in the diagram that I'm showing that we start off with a structure where 
our our main main point was related to functions so we create functions to to reuse the code then from there we moved across to object oriented programming where object is everything so there was a specific architectural design or patterns if you want to design an object oriented uh, programming language which are using to solve a business business problem then we moved across to uh, service module and object uh, module and component they both mean the same which is nothing but the object service is a bit bit different we will we'll go through it in the further slides now along with the service oriented architecture or, or, or services everything the way that you design your components on a service base add different uh, parts within them one of them is microservice there is also another architecture pattern which we call it as event driven architecture there are lots of uh, architecture which have been coming up popping out since 2004 till this point of 20 and currently microservices and event driven architecture are the hot topics that that we speak about so that's the history and uh, of where we are currently starting from when the word computer came into existence any questions so far Okay, if there are no questions, then I'll go on to the next slide. So whatever we saw in the first slide, I'm just trying to give an illustration. So you can see that on the right hand side, memory, mnemonics, operand, they basically are assembly code. As you can see, it's basically a set of instructions, nothing else. It's just a set of instructions, uh, nothing more to it. It doesn't have uh, any reusability. Uh, that's what that, 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 that says. Then from there down, if you come, you got the account file, transaction file, then process account. So that's what I was talking about, example of COBOL programming. So that COBOL programming uh, can also be put into a C with what I mentioned over there. So account file, transaction file, update account file. You have one single function, which will basically take the parameters. The parameter can be the file pointer of your, whichever file you want to run with, and uh, some parameters of what operation you want to do. Do you want to do a read or do you want to do a write? And uh, after doing a read or write, there should be something where you pass the data to. So that's what the var means. And the main main orchestration layer over here is the process implementation class. So in that process implementation class, you will have an entire logic of what I should be doing. First, I need to go and read the account file. Then for that particular account, I troll through the transaction file of finding all the transactions and I get the amount, whether it's a credit or debit, depending on that, I change my account balances and write it back to my updated account file. Take the next uh, record in the account file, do the processing. So that business logic is implemented in the process implementation class. That's what those two diagrams are. Then came the two-tier uh, uh, architecture, which is basically in the object-oriented world, we were very much aware of it. So at that point in time, we got green screens. Uh, people used to say in the olden days, green screens. Uh, what it means is that you walk into a branch the the branch employee will basically pick a green big green screen the green screen will have uh, a form like a structure which will display your account information so how the how was it working it was working on a basically a client server architecture so the machine that they are using is the client when they do some action it goes back to the server and that's the processing gets back the data displays it back on your client machine so simple, simple architecture, client server architecture. That's where we all started off. Then came the entire architecture where you had a presentation layer, which is basically your browser that, that happened because of the Java. Then you got an application server uh, layer, uh, which basically has the uh, application, which has a business logic, which is the JSP layer. Uh, sorry, the Java layer. Uh, then you have your data tier which is the last layer. So we got three layer architecture, which we say it as an entire architecture. Then from entire architecture, we came into something called SOA, which is the one that you see over here. So we started looking into services. From services, we went into microservices and that's where we are currently at. So in, in microservices, we still have monolithic architecture. You also got a microservice architecture. You also got another event-driven architecture, which we'll go through in the next few slides. So this basically gives a flavor of where we are as a part of history. All right, now, why, why, why are this new architectures like uh, microservices or uh, uh, event-driven architecture, why are they getting so much of traction? What is it that we are, we are basically looking at? Are we, reinvent, are, are we inventing something new here? If you look into it, technically speaking, 
we are not inventing anything new everything has been there since 1940 from the point when the new phase of computer was termed everything was there from that point what we are basically doing is we are expanding those concept giving new names to it so the word microservice services is basically service what is a service you 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 for example i have a company and i provide a service for example delivering flowers to client you as a customer come and tell me that i need to send a bouquet to some ex person then i take the order to do the payment then i do a service of picking up that flowers from wherever some who the supplier is then i go and deliver it to that person so i provide a service that's what services this has been happening since the uh, era that we all got civilized there's nothing nothing uh, fancy about service but you give a new terminology saying that it's a microservice i have been dealing with service but that's not going to be helpful for me as an as when i do operation because my profit levels are going down because of the x y z reason and uh, the expenditure that i'm having i want to reduce that such that i can increase my profit to do that you need to have your underlying way of doing your business micromanage that's what microservice basically says about that's the guideline the microservice gives so there's nothing new that that what we are seeing now it's all been existing we are basically expanding on on, on top of it giving a new name to it that's what has been happening in the last 20 years for example big data we talked about big data big data was already existing it was existing in the terms of data warehouse data warehouse is 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 quite a big database where you put all the data and it is able to manage it you can mine data out of it you can establish a pattern out of it that's what data warehousing was doing now the new terminology of big data came into existence it's the same thing but instead of using a very high end high specialized hardware you started using a local or a, or a, or a normal man's machine clumping it together creating a clustered distributed environment and you host your data over there and you process it that's what big data is all about and big data is mainly specifically currently used only for data science data analytics part of it which is exactly what we are doing when data warehouse was there it's nothing new we are just adding we are we are we are defining certain roles we are defining a boundary to it and we are giving a new name giving a big data that's what it is so it's all existing we are basically redefining them giving a new name now digital transformation is the main thing that's been happening in the last uh, 10 to 12 years which has been fueling all this new technologies to come alive or getting redefined from the old ways of doing things what is a digital transformation so we need to first of all understand why why this digital transformation is happening so digital transformation is nothing but basically it's a process it's a process uh, where you are using the new digital technology which are available to run your business that's what it's it's all about what i mean by that in the olden days let's take uh, my dad when he when he used to go to he wants to take some money he goes to a bank branch then he stands in a very big queue he writes a, a withdrawal a form then he goes to a teller along with his uh, account book then the teller will do something on his computer or uh, he will note it down in his notebook and uh, he will say yeah that's fine and he'll give a token number then we go and wait for our token to be called up when we call we'll go to the cashier the cashier will basically take the token number and it will give you the money that you requested that's what was happening before now as things progressed uh, we we just walk into a branch we don't need to go and get a counter now uh, or or go to teller to tell to give a form we just simply go and say that i want to withdraw money this is my passbook then he does something and immediately gives a cash to you that's 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 what a, a, a technological improvement facilitated the way that they do the business and as a customer my experience i was taking one and a half hours to get the money now it's reduced to half an hour now as the technology improved you don't even need to go to branch city bank for example when city bank got introduced in 1995 there was no branches you just walk into atm just put your card you get your money you just walk away within 5 minutes the money is there with you so the way the business was done for banking improved as a customer you are seeing that from 1 and a half hours to 30 minutes from 30 minutes 5 minutes that's it now we are in a era where you don't even need to go there uh, you just go to an online uh, 
uh, web page, you want to buy something, just say what your debit card number is, and if you say submit, that's it, done. So the way the business has been been done is is is, is evolving, and why is it evolving? It's because of the underlying technologies gives a facility to evolve. That's the reason why we are seeing so much of transformation, and that's what digital transformation is. In each and every step that you see where the business the way that they do business has, has improved, it's all because at the back end of it, there's something that's happening where a transformation, digital transformation is, is fueling it. That's what digital transformation is all about, to be, to be in a very high level, the definition of digital transformation. That's what's fueling all these new technologies that, that are coming up now. Now, there are different types of digital transformation. So the first, there are four, basically. So process transformation, what is the process transformation? What is that that's happening in the last 20 years that was not happening before. Uh, I will give a, a best example for this is uh, insurance. Uh, in insurance uh, world, before you go and take an insurance for your car, for example, uh, there's, there's the insurance guys have no idea how, what is the amount or what would be the uh, what would be the what would be the I am not getting the right word term for it. Uh, a right amount to be insured for, for the material that you want to insure it. He, he, he has no clue about it. He will basically baseline his, his insured amount based upon the, the product's uh, current value of the market. With that, he will define. And he doesn't even understand what is the risk of he giving the service of insuring it. Now, things improved where you get more information. For example, as an insurance company, I've seen that people who have taken insurance on their uh, motorcycle, uh, who are living in a very crowded environment or a crowded, uh, uh, crowded cities, the number of uh, uh, invent, uh, insurance claims that's coming up from that particular area is 60% more when compared to an urban area, which doesn't have much of a claim at all. Now, with this information, he can drill down his business process and say that, oh, all right, if a customer wants uh, insurance and he's living in, say, Bangalore, or he's living in Chennai, and it's another customer who is coming from, say, a small town like Neveli, that which doesn't sense? have any much of a customer claims at all, what he will do is that the insurance premium that I need to collect from a customer who is coming from a big city needs to be higher than from a person who is coming from a town. Because the risk of he coming into an accident or encountering an accident is much higher than a person who is coming from a town. So depending on, on this data that he has got, he can, he can do some, he has done analytics and he, has, he can find this data, a pattern. He can establish a pattern and he can change the way he's doing a business. That's what it's, it's process transformation is all about. So you have got so much of data, from the data you establish a pattern and from that pattern, you devise your, you change your business process to do your business. That's process transformation. Now for that, in the last 20 years, uh, the cost of memory, the cost of CPU, the cost of network, they all have drastically reduced. And in fact, they are, they are working much more faster now. And that has given us a way to do data analytics on near real time uh, fashion. That's, that's the reason why we are seeing this process transformation that's happening. The second one is the business model transformation. Now, as I explained to you in the previous point, because of process transformation, the business gets transformed. Now, one of the another example I can give for business model transformation is that in, in Europe, uh, if you want to deposit a check, you need to physically go to a branch or a machine to deposit a check. And that gets processed within three days. Now, in the Europe, uh, Europe has got a new framework which says that the clearance of a check needs to happen within 24 hours. That's one of the drive that they, they have put forth. Because of that, what has happened now is you don't need to go to a branch to deposit a check. What they do is you take your phone, you take a picture of the phone, uh, of, the, of the check, and you go to your uh, mobile app and upload that check, done. So you don't need to visit a branch and you do not wait for three days to get the money into your phone. Now, why is this business, business model has changed? It's because underlying technology that they are using has evolved in combination with the way the business model is working is fueling that, that, that the transformation. And another thing is that open banking. 
before i used to have a bank account say in sbi and uh, i also have another bank account in indian overseas bank now i need to log into their own internet banking to look at this account what if there was a single application which can give me access to both these accounts in one single app that would be better for a, for a customer experience instead of having two different uh, user ids you have to uh, remember two different passwords logging into two different uh, urls or sites instead of that one single site which deals with all so in europe there is another initiative that's taken where it's called open banking so open banking platform what does it mean by open banking platform all the banks in europe when they they come together they said that all right we are happy for uh, for someone to take in charge and access the bank accounts of our customers and you can use this particular platform to give them the service that's what open banking is all about so uh, there are some some new new uh, business process which are coming into into play which is also fueling the digital transformation then domain transformation is the third type what is the domain transformation so currently uh, when you want to run a program you basically need a, a system which which has a software which also needs to have an operating system and uh, you run your uh, application there now in the last few years you would have heard about something called cloud cloud computing it's 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 also exponentially getting popular now why what is this cloud computing all about so basically in a cloud computing uh, there are machines which are there but they logically uh, component or they contain it or they create as a container and they give a service so there are virtual servers which would be built on top of it you go and deploy your application application on the virtual server now that virtual server again it also has a uh, operating system it also has software and uh, and the cloud service provider would take care about the operating system patching the software upgrade from one version to another version you as a customer just simply need to go with your code just deploy it there so when i look as, a, as an organization instead of me creating a big data center Investing hell out of amount of money in, in in acquiring a mainframe or a mid-range computers or servers, and then on top of it, I also have cost to patch the operating system, keep my operating system secure, uh, and also the software move from one version to another version. As we move from one version to another version, you usually have dependency on the application layer. I also need to take care about changing my application because the version underlying software version is changing. So. As a, as, a, as, a, as a company, as a corporate for me, it, I have a hell lot of cost that I need to incur just to maintain this infrastructure. As I said, at some point people realize, the corporates realize that the salary that they're paying to their employees was smaller when compared to the cost they're inheriting on maintaining all this infrastructure. So cloud basically gave them a solution where they said that, all right, you don't worry about infrastructure, you don't worry about your patching, you don't worry about your operating system, or the software versioning, everything we will take care. You just bring you your uh, code, you just put it in there, and it will run. And you can expose that that service to the entire world. So that made the corporates to move away from the way of having a traditional data centers into virtual data centers. So that's the domain transformation that's currently happening, and that is also fueling the digital transformation. Last but not the least, the culture. So before in 1995 to 2004, people who are having a cell phone, only only people who are afford to have it will have it. Now that has changed. You 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 have 10,000 rupees. You just go. You can pick up a Android mobile. And when you have an Android mobile, you can have mobile apps, uh, either a banking app or insurance app or whatever you want to do, you can do with it. So people are 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 accepting the new technologies which are coming up and they, they started using it. So once once a person has a mobile phone, he doesn't need to go to bank branch at all. He can do everything what he wants to do with the mobile app. He can even transfer money without even logging into a mobile app nowadays. So people are accepting the technology. There's a shift in the way that, that the culture of, of dealing with things is changing. That's also fueling the digital transformation. Uh, most of the time, we don't even see money. For example, if you look at me, I haven't even held the uh, money in my hand for last more than two weeks now. Reason is that 
I don't need to go out of the house because of COVID-19. We are on a lockdown, but I don't need money. I still can do things what I want to do to build, to pay my bills, my, my standing orders and the instructions that I have given to my bank will automatically discharge the money that I need to pay to them. If I want to purchase something, I can on the online, I can do internet banking and then do a e-commerce transaction, which will do the payment. Or a worst case scenario, if, if for urgency, I want to go out to a shop, I don't need money because the shop is going to have a point of sale machine where you just swipe your card, enter your PIN, done and dusted. So you don't need to have money in your hand at all. So people are accepting the fact that, all right, I can, I can deal with my day-to-day -day life without having money in my hand. So that is also fueling the digital transformation. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, statistics. Before banks, uh, in 2013 to 2014, banks opened 10,269 new branches. Now, 20, 2014 to 2015, it reduced to 7,557. And in 2015 to 2016, it went to around 6,000 branches. In 2016 and 2017, there are only hardly 500 new branches that opened. In fact, in 2016, 2017, the number of branches that being shut down is increasing because no more people need to walk into a bank's branch to do bank transaction or maintain their accounts. So the culture is, is, is changing. That's what is fueling the digital transformation. That's digital transformation. Now going to microservice, the main thing. So we have understood why this, this the concept of microservice architecture or event driven architecture is coming to picture. It's all happening because of the digital transformation. That's what is fueling all this. All right, so now what is a microservice? Uh, before that, is there any questions from anybody? Bonu or anybody who is helping me out? I can't see any questions coming out anywhere. Everything is going on clearly, sir. All are waiting for the main topic, microservices. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right, then. All right. So microservices. What is a microservice? As I said to you, nothing that we are, invent uh, we are, we are, we are having as a new terminology is new. The, it's been already invented. Uh, we are basically adding extra bit to it and giving a new name to it. So before microservice came into existence, there was something called service oriented architecture, which, which popped up in 2004, and it went till 2012. Service oriented, service -oriented architecture was the main topic. So in service oriented architecture, what happens is that let's imagine that I have a system. In system, uh, let's take ordering system. You as a customer come to a web page and you say that I want to order pizza. Now. It's, it's, it's a single service. I'm basically selling pizza. That's my business. To, to do that business, what are the things that I need? First of all, I need to take, I need to communicate with the customer. So I need a website. Once the customer comes into my website, I need some way of identifying who that customer is. Uh, so you create, you ask the customer to enroll or register to your, to your site. So by registering, you know that, uh, okay, this particular mail ID, which is unique, you can identify, oh, that's that customer that, that, that's logged into my, into my site. So you ask him to register. So you need a way to, to, to get the customer get registered. Now, when you register it, you need to store it somewhere. So you need a backend uh, where you can store your data. So you need a database. So you have a customer page in which you have a form which takes details about the customer. When the customer is given, when he presses submit, it comes down to your backend. In the back end, you probably might do some kind of validation to check whether this customer already uh, existed in your database. If he doesn't, then you create a new customer by inserting that record into a database. So that's that's the first functionality. So you, you get the customer into your site and you identify, you have, you have a way of identifying the customer. Then once the customer has been identified, then you can start providing a service. So what is the service? You are going to show him a menu and say, well, these are the various pieces that I have in my place. Which one do you like? Then the customer can go and browse through that menu. So you are giving a facility for him to browse through the service that you're providing, which is the various pieces that you are selling. Then the customer will choose. So you have to give an option for the customer to choose what he wants. And after all this, he needs to say, that's final. This is my order. So you, you basically see something called cart. In every e-commerce site that you go, you have something called cart. So the customer keeps on picking up whatever he wants. 
And finally, when he's done with the shopping, he says, I'm done. He goes to a cart, he checks it out. So you need to maintain a cart and you need to have a facility to check out the cart. Now, when you check out the cart, you need on the back end, you have to do a lot of processing. So you have to go and identify what is the item, what is the unit price, how many units does the customer want? So I want Margarita Pizza, two Margarita Pizza, large size. So you will have a different uh, cost for it. So you have to go and understand what the cost is. How are you going to get it? Again, you have to go to the database, get that information with the item ID, get the uh, price, multiply it with your uh, number of units the customer wanted. Then you create a subtotal of it and uh, create subtotal for all the items that he has created. Then you create a uh, complete total and say, produce a statement saying that for this is what you have ordered. This is what the cost is. And then you have to include VAT and other taxes on top of it and say, this is the total cost. Then the customer will say, all right, fine, proceed. Then you take him to the next page where you need to take a payment from him until you take a payment. It's, no, it's not complete. You as a business, that's what you are interested in. Uh, so you need to have some kind of way to take the money from him. Now, since it's an e-commerce, assuming that he's going to use a PayPal or he's going to have a, a debit card or a credit card, then you, from your website, you need to have some kind of interface with those payment services. So if it's a PayPal, PayPal gives some kind of API service, which you need to integrate with them to say that this is the customer, this is the customer's uh, PayPal ID, and uh, he is trying to pay this much amount. Can you please take him, take the money? So it will go to the PayPal site. PayPal will do the uh, login of the customer. It will take the payment. Once it takes the payment, it knows what is the merchant ID that, that this, this payment is being taken for. Then on the back end of it, which will take asynchronously, that, that, that process is asynchronous. It doesn't happen immediately, but it takes after some time, PayPal will set, settle the merchant with this amount. And uh, for doing that service, the merchant has to pay some amount of commission to him. This all happens under the hood. But the important point is from your website perspective, you need to have some kind of integration with this payment service. That's PayPal. Now let's take Visa. Visa or your MasterCard, uh, which is basically your credit and debit cards. So whenever that card number is given, you need to go to Visa or Master and say, I got this particular uh, card number and this is the amount that I need to charge to the customer and this is my merchant ID. So you need to send this information to Visa. Visa will take, it will look into the customer uh, 16 digit number. They will do their validation. They will check whether the customer has enough money in his account for which Visa doesn't have that uh, uh, account detail. The customer account detail will be sitting with some banks. So Visa has to contact that bank. But anyway, the integration of Visa to that bank is that headache. But as a, as a, as a uh, pizza seller, you don't need to worry about that. That's that headache. But what you are expecting is Visa to come back and say that, yeah, all right, we have taken the money from him. This is a transaction ID. Uh, it's all done and dusted. Then you pick up that information and you go and display to the customer saying that the transaction is complete. This is a transaction ID for reference. And also you need to give him a bill. And once that's been done, it's still not done from your perspective because you have, you have taken an order. Now you had fulfilled order. So that needs to, that order needs to go and sit into an order uh, database. Now that order database will have an, another backend application. Uh, if you go into a pizza shop, the pizza shop will have a lot of monitors. In your monitor, you will see a lot of order popping up. So you need to integrate that bit of the service with this database where you are taking the order. Now that's a separate story altogether. Uh, which you will be integrating once that's been done uh, meaning the pizza has been prepared and it's been sent for delivery and the delivery case uh, as, as, as given delivery he updates the system somehow you get into your uh, databases and you pick the data and they can send it uh, show it back to the customer on the web page is the customer still on the web page saying saying that we have delivered it in so and so date and thank you for your service that's the use case so let's imagine so this is, this is the business process. I explained you the business process. I also explained about certain components which are required to fulfill this from your IT perspective. So you need to build all those things. Now, when the service oriented architecture came into picture, the service oriented architecture basically says that you need to identify your services, which correlates to your business process, and you need to couple, decouple them 
and uh, and and run with it that's what that's what the the architecture pattern says now it didn't very clearly sorry guys can you can you go on mute please thank you hello sir can you please unmute your voice microphone sir yes i have are you able to hear me yes sir yes sir all right okay fine i don't know where i lost you guys so i will repeat it again so basically the service owned architecture didn't give a very clear demarcation of what my service should should be where should i stop in building my service it simply said that if you have a common business functionality then you create a service which will execute that business logic that's what it said so without a clear demarcation people started using that service owned architecture oh i can create a service and they started creating a service what happened is that they ended up with a, a single service with multiple functionality and it became very big and it became a monolithic system what is a monolithic system i built a service that service is not specifically used for solving one problem it has a lot of other functionality so for example in the picture that i'm showing there so in the picture that you are showing seeing there in the monolithic i got mutual fund team customer master team data warehouse team and a ui team the ui team basically takes care about building the ui okay now they give the input on what their uh, website should look like all right so that goes that that comes into my into my service i build a service for the ui which is my basically my front end application which you see in the browser then the data warehousing guy says that oh all right okay once you have uh, taken your order and you have delivered your order i want all this data uh, in coming into my data warehouse so that i can analyze the data and identify which pizza is selling the most and uh, and which areas delivery is is going on time so i want to do this 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 analytics and also if i see that customers are leaving me uh, they are not even using they they created the login but they haven't used it for 6 months what can i do to make them to come down into my site so depending on people who are not logged in for last 6 months i i have the mail id so i can send a, a ad to them saying that uh we are currently having a 20% discount 30% discount so when people see that in the mail they can probably come into your uh, your or site or to order some pizza so the data warehousing team and the data science team or uh, the business analytics team would need those data that's happening into the system so they will say that these are the data i want as a requirement then the customer master team who maintains the customer uh, uh engagement uh, or the customer system itself they will have their own requirements all these requirements are, are put into one single service which is to deliver pizza now that particular service is grown so big because of many people giving many requirements it grows very big and all the logic is the thing within that one single piece of service even if i have based my service on a service oriented architecture i ending up with something which is very huge which just lots of functionality which it's not supposed to do at all and because of that i am ending up with a situation where when the data warehouse team comes and says that i need a i have a requirement can you please fulfill it and if the mutual funds team comes and says that i have a requirement can you please fulfill it the code needs to cater for those requirements it again depends on the implementation time scale where, what should go first should the requirement that's coming from the mutual team should go first or the data warehouse team should go first or are there any difference between those Uh, requirements now that makes the code maintenance very hard you are also putting a stopper saying that no because of the code dependency i can't deliver data warehousing requirements i can only deliver the mutual fund requirement they need to go first so you are basically slowing down your business opportunity that's what it technically means so in monolithic of a monolithic architecture which which even if you build it on a service owned architecture you end up with a big monolithic system so the monolithic architecture is what we use in the unstructured uh, uh, or object oriented programming existed but the the other reason why people went from 
functions to uh, modules or modules to components, components to service, they all were ending up with the same monolithic system. And even in service owned architecture, which was devised to avoid that happening, still ended up in the same situation. So we ended up with a very big application, which does a lot of things, having a lot of dependencies, having lots of uh, blockers to, 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 to respond to any of the business requirements or business needs. Your business is not moving anywhere. And the worst part is that all the services that we are building is dependent on a software, underlying software. For example, I'm using Java. Now, I built a service uh, which is uh, internationally standardized. International standard methods in Java version 1.6 is different from Java version 1.9. So what happens when Java version uh, keeps on increasing is they depreciate the old methods. Now, if my, mic, if my service is using those old depreciated methods, I need to uplift it to move to version 1.9. Now, because of that, uh, because I have a monolithic application where the logic is very huge, to change the depreciated methods to a new method, I have to invest almost 100K or 200K to do the uplift of those, those, those services. Now, 200K is very high for me. So what I would, I would try to do is that, okay, let's, let's, let's do the upliftment to a new version of Java later. They, they keep pushing it, keep pushing it. Now, years passed by, months passed by, years passed by, we're still in Java 1.6. Java version 1.9 and Java version 2 has come into existence. And uh, Java, which is supported by Oracle, Oracle comes and says that, all right, guys, I'm in Java version number two now. I'm going to stop supporting Java version 1.6. Now, you as a business, where are you left with? Your system is stuck in Java 1.6 because you don't have the money to uplift it because of the latest version of the Java is depreciated the methods that you're using to build your service. You are left with no other option to invest a huge amount of money within a short period of time to move it to Java version two. And that's, that's, that itself is a big project, which will take two years. By the end of that delivery, Java version 2.4 would have already come. You need to keep up with this. And, uh, and uh, most of the time, we, we end up with the old version of the Java or the old version of the Sardarling software and it becomes a legacy. That's what we use the term legacy for. Legacy is basically a software, or sorry, uh, an application that you have built, which is running or using the so underlying software, which is a very, very older version, which is out of support. Now, out of support, so what? It's an out of support, what is the big deal for me? If you're a small organization, it's not a big deal for you. It's, it's all right for you. But when it's a very big organization, it makes a sense because if, if something gets broken in production, we don't know what it is. The application, the bank guys will build the application. They know about the application, but they don't know how the underlying software works. So they have to get support from them. And who are those those providers? Basically, in this case, Oracle, who is providing the Java support. So you have to get in touch with Java guys and say Oracle guys and say that, guys, I have this issue. My virtual machine has broken down. I don't know whether it's because of the memory leakage or whatever it is, can you please investigate and give me a solution? Probably the Java itself had an issue, so they have to have a patch. That patch needs to come down to your production box, you implement it. So you definitely need to go and have a support from, because when this kind of things happens, your application team wouldn't be able to support you. That's the reason why we, we need to keep upgrading our underlying software, because you are dependent on the software provider to provide the software. In, case of you need some kind of failure that has happened and you need the support. That's very, very imperative if it's a big organization. Medium to large scale organization needs to keep in line with the latest version. Otherwise, they are going to end up with a legacy system. And ending of the legacy system means that it's a ticking time bomb. You need to invest a lot amount of money to upgrade to the latest version when you come into a situation. Mm -hmm. So that's, these are some of the issues that you face with monolithic application. Monolithic application basically means that one single piece of service doing hell lot of functionality, which it's not supposed to do at all. That's what monolithic application is all about. So people who are using service-oriented architecture, they still ended up with monolithic application. Now, microservice came into existence saying that, all right, that my service-oriented architecture gave you a view, but it didn't give a extended view of what, how the services should be built. So microservice came back and said that, all right, you can step back and look into your business process. 
So I have various business teams. I got a mutual funds team. I got a customer master team. I got a data warehouse team. I got a UA team. Now, if that is the case, instead of building services on your application uh, way, instead of that, you take a look into from your bus the way you do a business. So instead of creating a common service to to sell pizza, you create a service which will take an order. You create a service which will which will have the web application or the front end of the web application. You create a service which will contact the payment services to get the payment from them. So when you create a service with respect to your business process, it becomes uh, divided. So you're basically micromanaging the way you build your service. That's what microservice is all about. So microservice says that don't create a service which is jack of all trade. Instead, it needs to deal with only one trade and it's a master of the trade. That's what microservice says. So microservice will, will deal only with taking orders. And if you want to do a payment, then it will contact the payment microservice, which will take care about the payment and giving back the response to the order service if, if it's required. So that's what microservice uh, pattern or, or architecture pattern is. So there are four important patterns that microservice follows. You need to create a, a high maintainable and testable services. If you don't, you're not able to provide a, a build a highly maintainable and testable. What I mean by highly maintainable. Now in the microservice world, as I said, if you have a service which is only with order. Now, if there's a requirement from, from the products team, the products team is basically keeping track of what are the kind of pizzas that I'm selling. Tomorrow they are introducing a new pizza. Now, what this products team can say is, all right, uh, the ordering team, I'm introducing a new pizza. So I'm going to introduce one more new item into the menu. Now you need to be aware of this. So whenever a customer creates an order, you, you need to make sure that this particular new pizza has been taken care of. Now that's a requirement they are giving it from, from that perspective. Now, if you look at the way that things are built, the, the product guys will say that for this particular new pizza, this is the cost price of it. They will give it to the, uh, that the database saying that they sold the database saying that this particular new pizza is costing this much amount of money. Now, when the ordering system, you, the ordering system basically take, takes care about taking the order from the customer and, uh, it basically relies on the product system to pro provide what are the products that you're selling. So as long as the product system as included in that uh, bit of the work to display that new product, your ordering system will basically make use of that displaying that order. Now, or the other uh, products. Now, when the customer clicks that particular product, the ordering system knows, okay, this is something that, that he has done and the product system has included and it will go to the backend database and uh, pick up that in uh, the, the cost price of it and it will manage with it. So the way, because of the way that you are building your service, things are compartmentalized. They, they do what they are supposed to do and uh, that's what, it doesn't go beyond that. So basically you are setting up a boundary for your service saying, this is what my service should do. So we in the architecture didn't do that, but our microservice said that this is what you should do. Because of that, your, your code becomes highly maintainable. You can deliver anything just like that because it's, 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 it doesn't have any dependency. In the monolithic, there's a dependency because it's one single piece of a code. But here, that's not the case. Because you are divided that, it works in silo. It works in isolation. So that particular service will have its own database, which wouldn't be accessed by anybody else. If anybody else wants to access database, then they need to come back to the service, which is dealing with that, micro, uh, that database. So mutual fund microservice deals with my mutual fund database and customer master microservice will deal with customer master database. Customer master microservice, if it wants to get some data from the mutual fund database, then what it will do is it won't go directly in access. If you look at the monolithic, my, my var or the, my, my application, Java application, it has access to all the three databases, but in microservice world, that's not the case. Who has access to mutual fund database? Only the mutual fund service. So if the customer master service wants some data from that database, if you contact the mutual fund service, mutual fund microservice will then go and pick the data and give it back to it. So in this way, you are not directly accessing the database. The data layer is, is, is segregated because mutual fund is the only one who is dealing with it. So it becomes 
it becomes very easier to maintain and is also it's very easy testable as well and another important bit is you are decoupling the dependencies so you're basically building up a loosely coupled system so the mutual fund microservice by no means has any dependency to the customer master microservice or the customer master so customer master microservice doesn't have any dependency with the mutual microservice you are basically building a system which is loosely coupled loosely coupled means you do not have any dependency that's what it means and as you can see it's independently deployable so mutual funds team comes with a requirement then you change your uh, microservice uh, uh, to include that, that 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 requirement and you can test that part in silo it's isolated so independently, you can also deploy it as well. It doesn't have any dependency. You can basically go in with your uh, changes. And let's imagine that the customer master team has given a requirement. They are not ready. You can basically switch off that particular uh, uh, logic in your code. And until the customer master team is ready and they have implemented that change, then it's basically flipping a switch on such that the code which was dormant will start executing. In that way, you can manage your uh, 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 dependencies. So they are independently deployable and organized around business capability. And that's what I said. Instead of building one single service, which deals with providing a lot of other services, you are baselining based upon your the way that you do business. That's how you, you need to organize your services. Once you do that, you are not going to end up with a monolithic application. And another advantage, as I said about uh, the software being upgraded, everything, I will I will expand upon that on the next slide. How we can overcome that in a microservice-based uh, architecture. So that's that's about microservice in a, in a brief. Now I also want to cover one more aspect about uh, microservice. Along with microservice, there is also another architecture which I was talking about, event-driven architecture. Event-driven architecture also has the same features. It's high, highly maintainable. It will also end up with a loosely coupled uh, architecture. You can also have a independently deployable services and it would be organized around business capability. That is something that, that might not, but it all depends on how they are building the services. But there is a, there is a scope to, to fulfill your fourth point as well. Now, at the end of the slide, there are two different uh, uh, pictures which I have put in. So let's take an example of the, the insurance coding system. So in insurance coding system, uh, basically what, what it does is that you log into a site. Uh, in that site, you first of all, uh, as I said, login. It identifies who the customer is. Once you identify who the customer is, the customer has certain information. Where does he live? What is the car that uh, using? So I'm talking about a specific car insurance uh, coding system. So you need to maintain the customer where he is living. What is his name? What is his contact number? What is the car that he is been having? and uh, whether he has done uh, gone or experienced any accidents in the last five years uh, where does he keep his car parked in the nights is it in a separate a private garage or is it uh, on the roadside this kind of information that the customer management system will, will extract from the customer when he registers at the first time and it will automatically give a call to uh, insurance coding system now the insurance coding system will basically pick up the data and depending upon the customer parameters, it will go and identify who are the customer, uh, insurance providers who give insurance to this particular customer category and picks up the quotation from all those insurance providers and it displays it on the screen or it will send up a mail to the customer that, that, that he has registered with. That is a business process. In this business process, you can see that the customer management system basically invokes the insurance quoting. Now let's imagine a two different use case. The customer actually wants to buy a insurance coating. So he logs into the system, in which case the existing process of the customer management system giving a call to insurance coating system is absolutely fine. But let's imagine another use case where the customer has changed his address. He moved from Karlu to Pondicherry. He wants to go and update the customer management system uh, basically. So he has logged in, he's updating the system. Now. The customer management system needs to understand, okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a generic customer change, a customer information change. Now, is that mean that because of the change, should I call the insurance coding system now or not? 
it's a basically just a customer address change. If it's a customer address change, should I call the, the coding system or not? It's, it's something that it wouldn't know. What it would do is, because we are coded to always uh, call the coding system, it, even if you change a address, it will introduce induce a code to the coding system. Now, the customer doesn't even want that. Customer's main uh, use case is to go and update the address. That's it. He doesn't want to buy a insurance. In that way, in, in that in the particular use case, basically you are wasting your uh, resources by giving a call to a quotation system, the quotation system going and getting the quotation from various insurance providers and then sending out a mail to the customer. That's unwanted processing. Now, to, 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 to solve this issue, what we will do is, all right, my business logic is that if a customer logs in and if he changes the address, because the address at which the customer leaves has an impact to the insurance premium, you need to induce a insurance code. If it is only, if it is, sorry, can you guys go on mute? Others who doesn't talk, please. Thank you. Now, if it's not an address change, instead, I'm just logging in just to see what the information that I've given. In that scenario, the customer hasn't done any changes to his customer data. At that point in time, do not invoke the coding system. So I'm changing my business logic now. Now, by changing my business logic, now the question is, should I, should I make this uh, changes on my customer management system or, or insurance coding system? Where should this logic be, should be put in place? If I'm going to put it onto the customer management system, then the customer management system will take a decision and uh, give a code to insurance coding system. Insurance coding system doesn't even need to be aware of what is happening on the customer system. Now, if that is the case, it's absolutely fine. Let's imagine that tomorrow, not just the address. If customer is changing the car number as well, then I need to induce a code. So my, my, my business functionality is expanding. So we initially said that a generic login. Then we said that the customer changing their address should induce a customer coding. If he goes and changes the uh, car uh, registration number, then you need to induce a customer coding. If he has changed, uh, let's for example, in the customer management system, you also ask a question on how many household people do you, do you have? How many people will use the car? If the number of people who are using the car has nothing to do with my insurance coding, then I, I'm not bothered about that at all. Uh, so if the customer goes and changes that, there will be three people who will be using the car. My business logic says that it doesn't need to be today, but tomorrow that, that, that instance changes. Yeah, if another person is going to drive a car who hasn't registered initially, my insurance premium should go up because the risk is increasing now. So as your business evolves, your requirement changes. Now, if your requirement changes, you keep on adding your customer management system or you're amending or changing your insurance coding system. So you are creating a dependency. Now you can see where it's going. You're going to end up with a monolithic customer management system or insurance coding system, which has dependencies built within them. You ended up with a service oriented architecture having separate service, but you are adding dependencies because your, your business is expanding. Now, at, at, at certain period, you will see that, oh man, I want, I want, how can I, how can I divide this dependency between the insurance coding system and the customer management system? You need to rebuild, rethink, and invest a separate project to do that. Because you wouldn't be able to, to provide business as a business improves, your IT system wouldn't be able to cater for it. So you are going to become a stagnant. You will be sitting duck. So to, 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 how, to, how to overcome this, this scenario? So what the event-driven architecture basically says is that in kind of scenarios, don't worry about the business process. Ignore your business process. You, you don't worry about your business process or don't even think about where you need to be implementing that. What you need to be doing is, in the customer management system, don't worry about what kind of change the customer is doing. If customer logs in, just logs in, then what I will do is, that's an event that has happened. A customer has logged in, that's an event. Pick that event, publish it into some kind of messaging system. It could be a MQ, or it could be a Kafka, or it could be anything. It's just a messaging system. You just publish it there. Now, once you publish it there, the insurance coding system can, can keep a tap of that particular uh, messaging system. And as soon as an event comes that, it will pick it up, 
and it will decide oh okay the customer has logged in all right customer has logged in he hasn't done he hasn't asked for a quoting yet so i'm simply going to ignore this and it will simply ignore now let's imagine that a customer logged in and he changed the number of drivers from one to three then again the customer management will publish that data or that event into the messaging system that's it. it it doesn't even need to worry about it just whatever event happens it simply publishes couple of publishes publish publishes now the coding insurance coding system will keep tap of it it will go and uh, read now if it something that is interested on then it will pick it up it will process the data otherwise it will simply ignore now what are we doing here basically we are basically dividing the dependency between those two two services so the messaging system that you're introducing basically decouples these two services that's what event driven architecture is all about so don't look into uh, your 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 customer journey as a transaction look into it as an event and that event you just publish it anybody who is interested in that event will pick it up and process it that's event driven architecture now event driven architecture and microservice are extensions of service oriented architecture so service oriented architecture every, if you talk with some it people they will say that oh service oriented architecture is dead no it's still not dead service oriented architecture is still alive in an in, service oriented architecture aligns to a enterprise uh, pattern but your microservices and event driven architecture are to build your it system so it, it differs and the service oriented architecture as an extension to it which is nothing but the microservices and event driven architecture so that's that's the the funda about microservices and what and all other things are i know that it's already too late uh, but i just want to cover up one final thing before we move on now to use your microservices you need to be your system the, re the entire reason why you are bringing up microservices because you want your system to be agile what do you mean agile as my business grows up business requirement new business requirement comes up i need to deliver that functionality very fast i want to keep moving fast 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 everybody wants to move fast uh, before the cars used to go at uh, 60 miles per hour now people want cars which goes at 200 miles per hour even if you look at the bullet so trains usually go at 60 miles per hour bullet trains 200 miles per hour people want to go faster so the way the business is also run they also need to go faster so that is the expectation from business to, to fuel that even if you have your microservice architecture in place to deliver that microservice architecture the important aspect is you need something some way of delivering that code in a very fast phase so before we used to use waterfall model waterfall model is what it follows a sdlc pattern where you have a separate uh, requirements gathering phase then you have a design phase then you have a build phase then you have a test phase this all were happening around three months, three months, three months. So to deliver a project will take almost a year. That's what happens in waterfall. But now people are moving from waterfall model to agile model. Agile model, you move things in much more faster phase. So in agile, you usually that the time period is two, two weeks for a sprint. Uh, I, I don't know whether you guys are aware of the agile uh, concept, but we call it as a, as a, as a sprint. In sprint is basically one one unit of uh, uh, period at which you need to deliver something. That's what uh, uh, sprints are. So in one sprint, you need to deliver some concept. Uh, you need to deliver. It. That's that's what agile is all about. So for for agile, as a developer, I need to have a flexibility where I I implement the requirement, I code my requirement, I want a fast way of deploying and test it out. If that facility is not there, your microservice is not going to be helpful at all, or uh, it, it 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 doesn't doesn't help you to deliver the business expectation, fulfill the business expectation. So there's something called CI/CD pipeline. So you'd have heard about a concept called CI/CD, continuous integration and continuous deployment or delivery, continuous delivery, CI/CD. So organizations are currently building up, uh, uh, building up some kind of a pipeline where a code build test and deployment can happen in a very short period of time because most of the activities that you do in your uh, build build this manual uh, when we build is that uh, coding your code is manual but compilation of that code 
testing that code, deploying that code into production, these all are automated process, or these cannot be automated process. This all can be automated process. So what happens is that as a developer, I go and do a code change, I commit into my version control system. Once I, I commit into my version control system, there will be something that would pick up that new checked in code and it'll start the build. Build is basically compiling your uh, uh, code. So two and three triggering the build is basically commit process and the build is basically compiling your code, creating the executables. Then you need to notify whoever uh, has started the build saying that the build has gone successful or there are any errors. If there are any errors, then the developer can go and look into it and fix it. If there's nothing, then it moves on to the next one, which is run test. So in the run test, uh, there are a lot of testing. So you've got black box testing, white box testing, uh, white box testing, you weren't able to automate it before, but because of the new tools that we have got, so there is a framework called Cucumber. There's a new kind of uh, testing strategy called be behavioral uh, testing. So behavioral testing basically means that you understand how your code works, and uh, with that, you can create test cases in an automated way, and also execute them, and also check the output, whether it is right or not. So there's something called BDD testing that's, that's coming up. That's, that's one of the testing uh, framework which is coming up. For doing that, the Cucumber framework, which is a software technology, which is aiding them. So this all can be automated nowadays. So white box testing can be automated. Black box testing was already automated. That's the reason why you got something called J unit. You would have heard about something called J unit in Java, where you create a Java, the, the, the developer doesn't even need to create test cases. He simply puts it into the J unit and he executes the J unit it automatically creates the black box test cases and it comes back and says whether it's successful or not. So the black box testing automation existed since 2004. White box testing didn't exist, but now they are existing. So black box testing and white box testing both can be automated. So I can put it inside my pipeline, which can automatically trigger the build, which can create the executable, which can also notify the uh, person who has initiated the build. And also it can run test in a matter of few hours, it used to take almost three months before to do a white box testing when people are doing it manually. Because it's automated, that's reduced to half a day now. So if you put it into pipeline, the pipeline will automatically do your white box testing as well. And then it will notify the test outcome by uploading the report of those uh, test cases into a chat point. And then once that's all been done and dusted, you can also target it to an environment. So you have execution the executable can go to test environment or production environment. Now, once you have decided that, uh, depending on your configuration, the deployment will automatically happen. Everything is automated nowadays. So for, for that automated process, we call it as a CACD pipeline, that all, there are various tools. So number one, commit changes. So as I've given here, sorry. You use Git. Git is a version control system that most of the people use. As soon as you check the code inside the version control, Jenkins is a one of the tool which will trigger and do the build for you. So it, it can automatically, it will keep track of if any new code is coming into the version control. As soon as it sees that, it will automatically pick. It will identify whether it's uh, what framework within Java. So Java has a lot of framework. You got something called Node.js. You got something called React. You have something called Spring you got a lot of framework. It will identify what, what framework of Java they are using and it will automatically invoke the respective uh, compilation configuration and it will create the executable. Then once that executable uh, is, so the Maven is another tool which will basically do the build. It, it Maven as, uh, it's not only a building tool, it also resorts the dependencies. What do you mean by dependencies? In my Java code, I can use different libraries. Now, the same library can have multiple methods. So somebody has to resolve the dependencies. Maven automatically resolve those dependencies. It knows which libraries I need to extract or download the data from, such that my source code can start using it. So Maven basically uh, resolves the dependencies of the uh, required libraries, and it also starts the build. And uh, once the build has been completed, the output of that build we have something called like HipChat. HipChat is like a chat tool which we use within an organization. It's it's an enterprise chat tool. In it's integrated with uh, it's very easy to integrate with Maven. So Maven will say 
somebody has started executing this particular build uh, building this uh, component the output of this component is this it will it will give it to everybody who is interested can look into it so it, it collaborates with the organization along with that it also gives information of your build output it's all automated and then testing automatically from that it goes to testing we have something called vera code sap pack these are various tools that we currently use vera code basically can do uh, uh, testing for your uh, static application security testing so security is very important you when when you when you study things in your colleges you never encounter security as a big big thing but when it comes to organization security is as a very big pillar you you will come to know about it and there's no way that you can learn that because the security depends on the environment at which you are working on and that environment you wouldn't be able to give it in any of your uh uh, uh centers where you go and learn java or uh, big data they don't have that 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 that, that facility because setting up a security is, is is again a very big cost incurred on the infrastructure level so people don't do that so you when you go and try to learn a technology you will never get introduced to security aspects of it only when you get a job and uh, come inside a organization and start working in an organization you come into security so security is very is a paramount uh, importance for any organization so you, as a part of the pipeline we also do security testing as well which can be automated nowadays you, so there's some tool called vera code which will do a static application security testing and you also got something called zap which will do a dynamic application security testing and it will automatically upload this output of those tests into a sharepoint uh, sharepoint is something like within an organization uh, you, you got confluence I, I think i don't know, I think you guys have heard about confluence jira these are some of the tools uh, where as an organization you publish something it will be accessible to anybody within the organization so that's that's a portal basically so it 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 gives us uploads this report into the portal so anybody can go and look into it and uh, we also got uh, ansible and chef which takes care about the configuration once a code has been built you have something called root to life root to life tells you start with your development environment once the development environment has been done you put it into a test environment this test environment will be called as a component test environment where you test your components and also do a um, contract testing so contract testing basically means that integration points are tested out uh, that that contract defines the integration point what are the rules of that that integration so you do a contract testing once that's been done you move the code into a sit system integration testing that's where all other integration systems will be available and you will start doing the system integration testing as a system integration testing it goes to a non functional test environment where purely you test only the non functional aspects of your system what is the latency how many seconds i'm taking to process this requirement or this request when the request comes in all this kind of testing is done once that's been done only when all this testing has been signed off we finally go into deploying into production so if you look into the code the code goes from uh, unit testing to system testing from system testing to system integration testing then to non functional testing then to production so there is a way it follows so the configuration management will understand where is this this deployment started from which environment such that it knows what is the next higher environment where it has to do the deployment so it's all automated over there as well so the cicd pipeline that's what the devops currently do so you would have heard about a hot subject topic called devops devops responsibility is to set up this all build up this this pipeline for an any organization and they use this kind of tools to build up that one so that's what cicd is all about so cicd pipeline basically helps you to deliver your your microservices in a very agile way in a very faster way uh, thereby making your business very competitive with, with with anybody else that's what microservice helps and i think i'm going to stop over there thank you uh, any questions or anything uh, mr ramesh this is uh, prasad yes. a uh, very uh, nice presentation you have given a very elaborate presentation you have given right from the scratch you started with the object orientation and you end up with the microservices uh, very much thankful to you my question uh, can you able to hear me yes i can hear you go on yeah. uh, my question is is it advisable to go for monolithic architecture yes definitely i would ask my experience not only my experience the people 
uh, I don't know. I'll put some of the few people who are very, very brilliant people within the IT world. So there's something called Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler is said to be like a father of the current technologies. Yes. His observation is that he says that whenever you want to build a microservice-based architecture for a greenfield system, don't start from the scratch. Instead, you build a monolithic application. From monolithic application, you build your microservice architecture. The reason so why microservices is, is because basically a monolithic structure. Then it needs to start from there. Then you have to divide it out to a microservice. Okay. You you uh, need to build up as a one single component. From that one single component, you start to segregate the as per your business requirement or business uh, functionality, and you end up with a microservice. So, so you start with the monolithic. Yeah, you start with my monolithic, but end up with a microservice. That's the best pattern to go. So, so uh, uh, the uh, as per your um, uh, uh, speech, so microservices. Can I take that microservices is not monolithic. After it becomes a microservice, it doesn't follow a monolithic structure. Correct. That's right. You're absolutely right. So you have and, to start uh, with uh, monolithic. Yes, you need to start. So more, you need to start with monolithic because most of the organization which tried microservice from the scratch, they all went burst. They all went first because they didn't understand what 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 the hell are they doing. But there are there are a lot of organizations, for example, Netflix, Amazon. They all started with a monolithic application, and they went into microservice and they're flourishing. So if you look at the pattern, people who started with monolithic and went into microservice are flourishing. People who started with microservice from the scratch, they all went burst. Fine. So can you give some real example where actually microservices has been deployed right now? Yeah, so Netflix currently uses mono, uh, sorry, uses microservices. Uh, your Facebook uses mono, uh, microservices. Most of the uh, application which are very, very frequently accessed by more number of people, they all use okay. microservices. Okay. okay. Then one more uh, thing. Uh, you said that microservices uh, follows the uh, CI/CD, that is continuous integration, continuous deployment model. Yeah. And you suggested yeah. that it follows an agile uh, development rather than a conventional software development like a waterfall model or any other type of uh, software Correct. development model. So if you take agile, there are a lot of agile development like Scrum, uh, DSGD like that. Is there any specific agile model uh, that is being followed for? Uh, uh, okay. So agile is a, is a concept. Agile is a concept. Scrum is there. Kanban is there. Yes. There are lots of subdivision to it. But under the hood, they all follow the same process, which is you you you, you start yeah fast you take up yes. a unit work of requirement yes yes you yes, deliver yes. that fast yes. that's it and yes. move on okay. it all follows the same pattern so doesn't don't worry about those things as i said to you nothing is new everything no. exists already we are giving a new terminology to it with a new definition that's it okay. now uh, uh, last my last question please uh, don't mistake me no, no, uh, go on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you're asking. So now I want to have a clear delineation when a service becomes a microservice. Say, for example, now I'm having a print service or a fax service. Okay, now I want to make the print service as a microservice. I'm, my question okay. is for uh, my question is for uh, in the uh, in the aspect of deploying deploying a service in an energy constrained environment. Okay, energy so in that case, environment. So in that case, I want to break down my major service into a microservice. Say for example, let us take a print service. A print service offered by an operating system. Yeah, 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 okay. Now I want to make the print service to become, a, to, to make it in a microservice, micro print service. Okay. So what, okay. what actually I have to do to make a print service as a micro print service? All right, okay, fine. I will... Can I see your screen? Yes, yes, I can see. Okay, all right. Then. So, uh... yes, yeah, screen is only halfway through. It's only halfway through. Just a second. No, no, it is not visible. You are typing something. Yes, yes. Yes, I am. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I can see. Print service and printer.
this is what you want this is what you currently have if you no, want to actually, do it as a microservice uh, yes yes please continue please continue so this is what you currently have i'm assuming and you, what you mm. want to do is you want to do change it to a microservice what i would do is mm. are you creating in a small use case yes i am so so print service is we currently going to the printer uh, or it gives the data now okay let's imagine that instead of that i want a print service called print service from word okay and i also going to increase this to say print service from the notepad i want to use this okay for for two different people mm. as not so uh, from keyword keyword and i'll say it as the notepad okay. okay then i will do as p w r d to the message and i will also say p notepad to message. message so now what happens there was a hard difference between your print service and printer if i want yes. to change this print service to something else i need to amend that component or the service now okay. instead of that whatever you want to have you this is this the stop layer that you see in the second diagram is mm. publishing it to a kafka topic or a message and the printer takes the data from that you are basically okay. taking off that dependency so here mm -hmm. that, that 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 i can also have a introduce one more layer between on the top of the kafka saying a service and that service will be consumed by word and notepad which is called it in okay. now if i want to do some sort of formatting uh, can i introduce that formatting as a business layer in between these two yeah of course why not why not why okay. not you can then uh, from your uh, from your code i can understand uh, uh, i want to know whether i am right or wrong Uh, so this prints this microservice enables me to uh, get a print out only from a word or a notepad in case if i am going to uh, this is way how i can understand your code so what i will do is instead of start from message it will go to my micro my micro and it would be my micro what is it my micro is it a variable micro is a it's a new microservice So okay. microservice called a new microservice, an interesting new microservice. Okay. So my Word and uh, Notepad will publish the data into a Kafka topic. From the Kafka okay. topic, I will have a microservice as a consumer that will pick oh, up the data and mm -hmm. it will contact the printer. So tomorrow, I want to start using the PowerPoint. The mm -hmm. PowerPoint will also publish into the Kafka topic. My microservice fine, doesn't fine. code need doesn't mm -hmm. need to change at all. Fine, fine, fine. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank okay. you for uh, uh, explanation. Thank you, Mr. Ramesh. Thank you for your questions. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank any you. other any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ramesh sir, and thank you, Prasad sir, for your uh, very clear and crystal clear answers and uh, very valuable questions. Thank you, sir. Now I call upon Sita, ma'am, for both of thanks. Good evening to one and all gathered here. Um, Thank you is the best prayer that anyone could say. Thank you expresses extreme gratitude, humility, and understanding. First of all, I would like to thank our vice chairman, Sri Parini Raja sir, for his constant support and motivation. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank our principal, Dr. J. Sukumar sir, as he has been our role model in all means. Thank you, sir. Most importantly, a great thanks to our speaker, Ramesh Babu sir. 
software architect london for his for his enlightening presentation on microservices your explanation specifically on digital transformation and conversion of service to microservice was awesome sir we are all privileged to gain knowledge from you this evening sir thank you so much sir for your time thanks to kumar sir the uh, head department of commerce and coordinator of iqac thanks to all the participants hod staffs and students of sharada gangadharan college and other colleges without whom this seminar wouldn't have become so successful last but not the least a big thanks to god almighty for his gracious presence thank you one and all thank you thank you thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, my special thanks to mr swaminathan and mr parlinash and uh, mr sugma and also to jeno thank you so much for this opportunity thank you ramesh sir participants kindly fill the feedback form that has been posted in the chat room as well as in the youtube chat room so that you could get the certificates as early as as possible please fill the feedback form thank you thank you participants thank you Ramesh sir and one and all. Ramesh sir, this is Jeno madam. Thank you sir. Thank you very much for spending your time with us. Thank you. No, sir. it's my it's my pleasure, Jeno madam. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Your support is very all the best. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Cheers. Thank you then. Bye. Bye.